Hi. How are you? Hi, Dean. Thank you so much for joining me here. Um, why, don't we, why don't we just start by you talking about first what it is, why you started it, and what you've seen in the years since, since it began. Let me start by what it isn't. <laughs> it's not an education program. 25 years ago, as today, it's a topic that most serious people are pretty concerned and passionate about, parents, teachers, corporations, government. But the prevailing concern is we have an education crisis in this country. I think I'm an inventor. What do inventors do? Inventors look at the same problems everybody else look at and see them differently. It's really quite silly to imagine that America has an education crisis. We have more schools at every level, universities. We have more money spent on education than most of the rest of the world combined. It is not an education crisis. It's a culture crisis. It's not a supply problem, more teachers, more standards, more books, more money. It's a demand or lack of demand problem. We have a culture that's free. Even kids are free. And in a free culture, you get the best of what you celebrate. Kids celebrate sports heroes and movie stars. 25 years ago, I said, why don't we form an organization, a not-for-profit, that uses that powerful model of sports and entertainment, but the content isn't bounce, 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 throw. <laughs> That's not a very useful skill set for all but a few dozen people. <laughs> I figured, if we could make science and engineering as fun, accessible, attractive to kids as the other things they aspire to do, we'll change their attitude, we'll change the direction of their life, particularly so, women and minorities, that really our culture convinces them by the time they're 10 years old. Science and engineering, A, it's boring, esoteric, difficult, and it's only for guys, white guys. And uh, you heard Megan Smith this morning, you heard a lot of people talk about this issue. Unless we can get our culture re-energized to be passionate about inventing, solving problems, working hard at things that matter, we're going to become what we deserve to become. So the basic idea is how do you create a demand for that science education? And first was set up with a single goal, create demand, particularly among women and minorities, to excel at something that could be a career choice for them. You know, we, we claim we have a job shortage in this country. That's not true. We have a skill shortage in this country. I've got a little company with 600 engineers, and I've got 100 openings. Every tech company I know would kill to get more people. We do not go around any major university, go to any place where they're doing genomics, proteomics, code, nanotechnology, advanced materials. Everybody's desperately looking for smart people. We, technology has moved so quickly, and unfortunately, our education system hasn't kept up with it, and we're seeing a problem. And we've even, I think the political rhetoric is even insulting. We need jobs for kids. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets up in the morning wanting a job. We want a career. We want to do something exciting. Kids should expect to have more than a job, and we should give them the skill sets to succeed at those dreams. So what do you see at FIRST? What, what excites kids now? What has changed in the 25 years since FIRST was established? What's, what, is, what is there for them, and what's making them... I can tell you that we have some actual academic longitudinal studies funded by people like the Ford Foundation and Brandeis Universities, but we have just literally tens of thousands of anecdotal uh, facts. Kids that go through first are dramatically more likely to stay in school, to go on to college, to study science technology. We hire them now, you know. 25 years doesn't seem like a long time in the scale of a country or a big company. Four years is an entire generation of high school. The ones that started 25 years ago went through high school, went through college. They're now out either working at some of our great sponsoring companies or starting their own companies. And now we had 23 teams compete in year one. Last year we had 35,000 schools from 81 wow. countries and 180,000 volunteer scientists and engineers as mentors for these kids. Wow. Most companies would like growth like that. And the, this year it'll be again in January. How many? This year in January, we expect to hand out closer to 40,000 kits. We have 182 university-sponsored teams. Last year, they gave us about $25 million in scholarships handed out at the championship in a 76,000-seat domed arena in St. Louis. And we'll be bigger and better this year. That's great. Um, I would like to talk about kind of 
some of the ways in which science and technology, um, particularly through your work in prosthetics, when, you, when just the, the real ramifications in people's lives that you can see and that you have, in fact, brought about. Um, and I, I want to hear about your work in prosthetics and how you got into that and what you've seen. And just in the past few years, how much has changed? Well, the prosthetics is easy. Most things I can't tell you how we get into it. Just life does things to you. The prosthetics, I was minding my own business, which is rare for me, <laughs> doing my day job stuff, mostly making medical equipment, dialysis equipment, insulin pumps, stents, and then my, which that's my day job, it funds my fantasies like water and power mm -hmm. and first, not for profits. I get uh, the, the virtual knock at the door from the Department of Defense and DARPA and a very passionate colonel who happened to be coming back from his fourth or fifth trip to Afghanistan in Iraq. By the way, this colonel is a neurosurgeon. And there he is in my office saying, I can't believe it. At the end of the Civil War, when a soldier lost his arm, we put a wooden stick on him with a hook on it. Now, look at the technology we give these young people to defend us, but when they lose their arm to a IED, we give them a plastic stick with a hook on it. These young people deserve way more than that, and you're going to deliver it. And then he describes he wants full capability, right. fine motor control. He wants to flex at a wrist, at an elbow, abduct and flex at a shoulder, fully autonomous, completely self-contained, carrying its own power, fit on a 50th percentile female, and be done in two years. Um, it makes you appreciate how complicated an arm is. Well, I'm happy to say we, we delivered something that I think uh, they were very excited about. We made in second generation, and we now have them on about 30 soldiers. Wow. Yeah. Have you gotten to meet with the people who are using them? Oh, yes, and it's astounding. But the most astounding thing to me, I don't know what your backgrounds are, but the rest of my life is mostly medical equipment. And no matter who you put it on, people that have had an issue, they need our artificial organs. They need dialysis. People inevitably feel like victims. They, are, they feel entitled. They feel, as I would, afraid and sorry for themselves. They could be 90, and they want that knee replaced so they can play tennis. These young people put these arms on, and without exception, they sit there thanking you. They've given their arms, and they... And they they want to, I've never seen a group of people so committed and so passionate. They, 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 they're not despondent, they're not angry, they're not depressed. Most of them want to go back and help their buddies. It's an astounding group of people, and you just feel good that you can help them. One of the things... Um, one of the things I heard you say in one of your TED Talks was that it's, this isn't about the technology, it's about the people and stories. What do you mean by that and kind of how does that motivate you in your work?